Okay. Hi. Uh, so, <laughs> so uh, yeah, this is the talk. Uh, Peaking Poking Memory, Hacking a ZX Spectrum. For those of you curious, um, I'm Dale. I work by day as a software developer at a company called Cynet. I do lots of mobile stuff and all kinds of other crazy things. I'm not a security consultant. I don't do any of that kind of stuff. I just groove around on weekends. Um, if you want, follow me on Twitter. Uh, and that's my webpage. I never update. So, we'll start off with the 1980s. Um, judging by the room, most of you probably remember this time period. Uh, for those who don't, we'll give you a quick intro. I'm sure you'll recognize those guys. I'm sure you remember that. And who can forget him? And my favorite, MacGyver. That was the 80s. For those of you who don't know, this was what computing in the 80s looked like. That is a Commodore 64. Uh, very popular old computer. That there is a BBC Micro, and pretty much what I learned to program on. And that is an Apple II. Now, all those computers are really cool. The problem is, at that time, they were very expensive. This is a Sinclair ZX Spectrum. Um, it was a relatively cheap machine, and even in South Africa, it was very popular. The computer was made by a company called uh, Sinclair Research, which uh, was created by Clive Sinclair, now Sir Clive Sinclair. Uh, it was their third computer. It was first released on 23rd of April 1982, which means that technically this machine is older than I am. Uh, it was replaced. It was the replacement to the ZX80 and the ZX81. Uh, if you, you ever get to play with those machines, they're very interesting. Pressing a keyboard, when you type on the keyboard, the screen switches off because it can't drive both the screen and the key, read the keys at the same time. Over 5 million of these ZX Spectrums in various models were sold. That excludes the clones. Uh, they were copied all over Russia and places like that. Um, and it was only finally discontinued in 1992. Uh, Alan Sugar's company actually bought over uh, most of Sinclair's research, and they just carried on making them because they were selling and people were making money. So, some details about the ZX Spectrum. Uh, the one I have here and the one I've hacked is an issue 3B released in 1983. It's got a Zilog Z80 CPU running at a whole 3.5 megahertz. It's got a 16K ROM. 48K RAM, although technically originally they got released with 16K and you had to buy the extra 32K upgrade. Uh, thankfully, by the time they got to the 3B, they decided to include it. It's got an RF modulator for TV output, a tape interface for mass storage, an edge connector, and the iconic rubber keyboard, which if you've ever used one in things, you'll know is the worst thing ever created. So, for those of you who don't understand what I mean by mass storage, this is what 80s mass storage looked like. That's what you stored all your programs on, and that's what you copied when you wanted to borrow someone else's program. Probably just getting yeah. <laughs> uh, obviously destroyed by heat, sun, and all kinds of other things. Uh, and uh, good luck to anyone who actually got them successfully to load on first try. They never seem to. Interestingly, in the 80s, there was actually open source. GitHub looked like this. For those of you who don't know, in the back of magazines and at your local library, you could buy books with that. That is actually basic code. It's all, you had to type it in. There was little indicators to say, hey, this is a com for a Commodore, this is for a Sinclair, etc. The favorite was you'd type all this in, someone would pull the plug and the thing would reset and you'd have to start again. Or worse, you made a mistake somewhere. I'm not joking when I say there's actual code. There is a zoomed in image. You can see the data lines, etc. Some of that is actually machine code. So the trick to getting speed was you did most of your code in basic and then the speed optimized things you did in machine code as data entries and loaded them in. Programming on these machines was all done in a basic interpreter. Those of you who played with the badges will find one on there. Um, that was the standard way. The machine booted up into a basic interpreter and you coded all your code in basic. The other option was machine code, uh, which is after you've assembled your code. There was assembly available and you, if you were lucky enough, you could get a tape, 
load the tape and you've got an assembler, but there was no real point because the assembly matched over to the machine code relatively easy. You could hand assemble the code. There were no real compilers. You have to remember this machine ran at 3.5 megahertz and had 48K RAM. You're not going to put a C compiler in that easily. You're not going to put a Pascal compiler in that easy. So normally what you would do is you would run your write your code on a much more powerful machine, compile it down, and transfer it across. That's assuming you actually bothered to use that. A lot of the code was written as hand-coded, fine-tuned machine code. So why on earth am I hacking a 35-year-old computer? <laughs> So I guess the first thing is it's unlikely to be used in the AI uprising or anything else like that. Uh, the other one is I'm not going to get arrested. No black helicopters are going to land in my backyard or anything else. No one cares about this machine anymore. The copyrights have expired. A lot of the companies have opened what is there available. You can download the schematics for these machines. You can get all the information online. Truthfully, that's the reason. I enjoy learning new things, and this seemed like a fun challenge. So, the cool thing about a ZX Spectrum is one person can truly understand this machine. What I mean by that is that is the complete main board of my ZX Spectrum. That's the Z80 CPU. Over here is the ULA. Now, the ULA handles the drawing functions and everything else. So, what it does is there's a portion of the memory, the ULL. ULA takes that memory and draws it to your screen. The ULA is also responsible for the clock of the CPU. So what happens is, there's a bunch of crystals there that generate the clock signal. They flow into the ULA, and then the ULA sends that clock signal on to the Z80 CPU. What this means is the ULA can pause the CPU or stretch time by making those pulses shorter and longer, which uh, makes for interesting things, but basically... If the ULA decides to draw to the screen, it can halt the CPU without actually halting the CPU, just saying, oh, your clock cycle is going to take a little bit longer this time around, and it goes and reads from the memory and writes to the screen. That means hacking this thing is really weird, as you'll see. Other than that, uh, over here is the 16K RAM. That's what originally shipped on the machine. That should be on this model DRAM, um, which means that it's got to be constantly refreshed. Over there is the upper RAM, which is the 32K RAM. Uh, interestingly, a lot of those RAM chips were normally, I think it's 8K, but they were actually 16K RAM chips. They just used half. That way they could buy dodgy 16K RAM where, and then pick which half of the chip worked. Uh, this machine was built to a price, um, as you, becomes evident the more you play with them. Uh, over there is the 16K ROM, which holds ba a basic interpreter and whatever minimal codes required to boot the machine. That is the RF modulator. On these machines, uh, back in the day, no one had, you didn't have high resolution displays, not at home. So what you would do is you'd plug this thing into your antenna jack on your old big CRT TV and, this, and tune to a specific channel, and then this thing would display the imaging. <laughs> That is the trusty tape interface. This is the expansion port, which I'll come to a bit later. And that's the beep speaker, which anyone who's played with these things will know. They sound terrible, but you know, it's got a beep. And over there is the power. So that is the edge connector. Okay, you can't quite see, but uh, the edge connector is a 54 pin. Edge, PCB edge connector. And this is what got me interested in this whole hacking as ZX Spectrum. If you look at those uh, various pins, you'll notice something interesting. This is a Z80 CPU pinout. There's an address bus of 16 bits, an 8-bit data bus, the CPU control, system control, and various other things. If you just take a look at those uh, names, and then look at the bus again, you'll see the same thing. There is the address bus for the Z80 CPU. There's the data bus. There's the I.O. control lines. And this one is the interesting one. That there in the corner is a ROM CS, or chip select. By, chain, by putting that line, I think it's low, what happens is it disables the onboard ROM built into the ZX Spectrum and allows you to plug a ROM externally. Now, my crazy plan when I saw this was, does that mean I can emulate a ROM chip in code and load my own code onto a ZX Spectrum. So, we'll get to that. Peeking and poking, what do I mean by peeking and poking? 
That's how you read memory on a ZX Spectrum. You can read the entire range at the moment. 4000 is the frame buffer. Uh, you literally, at basic prompt, just say A equals peak, read a value, and it will read the byte that is at that address. Poking is the same. You can just write any value to any memory anywhere, which means that if you're fooling around, you can very easily reset the machine, draw funny characters onto the screen, crash it, or, uh, yeah, do all kinds of interesting things play audio and stuff like that. This is how one of the ways that people would write optimized code for it was you could actually poke values into RAM for your own code, your machine code, jump to that location and execute it. So that's the memory map of the ZX Spectrum. The first 16K is the ROM. Then there's a bit of screen memory. Uh, after that comes the more screen memory, which stores the color data. The color data is broken up into blocks, and each, each byte is um, eight dots on the screen, and so what happens is you can only set the color for a specific block on the screen. So graphics gets a little bit weird. There are tricks by looping really quickly and fiddling with RAM values. You can actually set individual pixels. Uh, I tried to do some of this. Yeah, my coding skills aren't that good. So um, <laughs> good luck to those who want to try it. So, yeah. <laughs> this is how you hacked a ZX Spectrum in the 80s. This is a wonderful tool called the Multiface One by a company called Romantic Robot. You have to love 80s computer company names. <laughs> so this device plugged into the back of the ZX Spectrum. What would happen is by pressing that fancy red button on there, it, send a non, it triggers a non-maskable interrupt. It causes the, uh, basically the Z80 CPU to jump to a specific address in the ROM and execute whatever code's in there. On the standard Z80, uh, ZX Spectrum ROM, all that does is reboot the machine. But what the Romantic Robot company did is they built their own ROM image, which sits in that box. So when you press the button, it swaps their ROM in, which has got a fancy little bit of code at that address. So when you press the button, it launches that. What this application allows you to do is poke values into the current running application. You can dump the current memory to a tape drive, and you can, put, in general, cause all kinds of havoc. The most common use for this was pirating games that you couldn't otherwise pirate. So if you had a ROM game, you could dump once it was loaded into memory and then dump it out to tape and things like that. So most people own these things used for that. But you can also use it for more sort of legal reasons, like in the old days, debugging applications and things like that. On a ZX Spectrum, there's no real way to like do normal debugging and step throughs and things like that. It's, you can, but yeah, it, back in the 80s, it wasn't easy. So at least this way, you could actually go and see and read memory values and stuff. Okay, so I won't do the demo, but uh, my plan. So this is how it all got started. I decided I was going to take a Raspberry Pi and fasten it to the back of a ZX Spectrum. Unfortunately, there's a few problems. The Raspberry Pi is a 3.3 volt device. The ZX Spectrum is a 5 volt. The Raspberry Pi is not 5 volt tolerant. What this means is 5 is greater than 3.3, so boom, that happens. Uh, I thankfully didn't let the magic smoke out, but technically you'll damage your Raspberry Pi if you plug it into the back. There are ways around this. You can fix it with a bi-directional level shifter. Um, the ones I use use little FETs. It does work. The next problem was I needed I.O. Uh, there is a 16 address lines, eight data lines for the data bus. There's three, a minimum of three control lines I would need, uh, read, write, and the memory request, and then the clock line. If you add all those up, you come to 20, what, 20, 27, 28, or something. There's only 26 free I.O. lines available on a Raspberry Pi. You can get more by using um, shift registers and things like that, but it greatly complex, complicates life. And I was trying to do this without complicating my life. So yeah. So now, this is what my plan was. I was take a Raspberry Pi and what they call a uh, bus expansion chip. These particular chips by microchip are very cool. What they allow you to do is you can talk uh, SPI to them, and it gives you a 16-bit uh, GPIO pin out the end. 
they allow for bi-directional, and technically you can clock them at 20 megahertz. So the plan was, I will take two of those, which would give me 32 I.O. lines, wire that up to the, to the back of the ZX Spectrum, and that should work, right? Yeah, no, it doesn't. The problem comes in is this. Linux is not a real-time OS. What I mean by real-time is there is no, I don't know how long or how many clock cycles will occur between each call. So what will normally happen is you'll say, get me some data, and then get me some more data. The gap between those two gets can be anything from milliseconds to 10 minutes, depending on what your system, system D, and all the other rubbish running on a Linux system takes. So what you can do, if you're brave, is you can write a kernel driver. I don't know how many of you have written kernel drivers. Uh, it's not fun, it's not quick, and no, I'm not gonna do that. The other option is you can write bare metal ARM code. The Raspberry Pi is very cool because the, all the compilers are made available. So if you really want to, you can write ARM code and run it on the Raspberry Pi as a BAM machine. The problem is it requires a lot of code just to bring up things like displays and all that kind of stuff, let alone the Wi-Fi networking or any of the other functions that I would like when I'm trying to integrate with it. So my new plan, take replace the Raspberry Pi with one of these things. This is a ST Discovery 4. It's made by uh, ST Microelectronics. It's got a 168 megahertz ARM Cortex M4 processor, one meg of flash, 192K of RAM, about 56 I.O. pins, depending on how you configure it. It's five volt tolerant, so I don't need shift registers. It supports DMA, which I'll get to. And it's got lots and lots of URs. So the new plan goes like this. USB to the STM over a serial adapter. Yes, that is the board rate underneath there. Um, and that's stable. I tried double that. And unfortunately, yeah, it doesn't work. You start losing characters. So that's about the, the maximum board rate I could get using an FTDI chip, uh, USB to serial adapter. That then's plugged into the back of the ZX Spectrum. Now, for those of you who are curious, this bundle of wires uh, there on my desk is more or less what it looks like. Um, that does work uh, as long as I don't touch it, as long as my kid doesn't come near it, as long as the wind doesn't change direction and everything else, but it does work. So the code on the ST Discovery does this. There's an interrupt routine that gets triggered on every single clock pulse from the ZX Spectrum. Each clock pulse, I get the read-write state of the bus, I then read the address, I then read the data bus, and then I push all that into a buffer. Now, if you've tried, you've got to do this in as little code as possible because you are limited, because obviously there's a clock pulse every 3. Point, well, 3.5 megahertz, so you've got to constantly grab stuff and throw it into this buffer. Now, you've got it lying in a buffer and you've got to get that off of your microcontroller onto your PC. That's what took me a number of weeks to get right. In the end, you use a DMA transfer. DMA is really cool on these chips in that you configure the DMA controller in the background. You say, take the data from this array and spit it out of this port. And everything will then quietly happen in the background. You don't have to service it, and it doesn't take any of the clock cycles away from the standard way the CPU works. Uh, in this case, it's just a, circ a giant circular buffer, so I just keep throwing things in, and it keeps spitting them out on the serial port. I then read this data and pull it into a Python script that I can display on screen. The nice thing is now my PC only has to have handle the characters coming across the serial link. I don't have to try and read from ports and that, so I can just use Python and display it. So in the end, I wrote that. I can't quite see. But what that is is all the red values are being written to those memory addresses, and all the green values are being read from those memory addresses. This application allows me to read and the entire address range on the ZX as the ZX scans through the address range. I can also poke new values into all those locations. So technically, I can script my ZX. Everything should be happening over this data bus, so I can control the keyboard and things like that. I say technically because uh, <clears throat> it kind of works. The reading speed must be fast. Um, my code is good, but not good enough yet. At some point, I will get it faster. Either I need to speed up my transmit speed because I'm losing a few characters in, the in my circular buffer, or I need to read faster. Um, 
bad connections, as you saw my current, and it's in this box if anyone would like to see it, is lots and lots of wires all badly joined. This means that anything I do, I can easily lose a bit. And if you know anything, one bit is really bad if you lose it. So, yeah. When writing, if you get your timing wrong, it, it kills your ZX. Either the ZX will crash with pretty colors if you're lucky, or it just resets. Um, bus collisions. If the ZX is right talking on the bus while I'm talking on the bus, the two collide, and whoever happened to talk last seems to win sometimes. Again, this resets the ZX. So, how would I improve this? Well, the first thing is make a PCB so I get rid of all my stupid wire connections. If I have less connections, hopefully it'd be better. The correct way to do this is a CPLD or an FPGA. Uh, that way, what I'm currently, a lot of what I'm doing in software can be done in hardware, which means speed no longer matters. Hardware is near instant for this, in this um, thing. The other thing I tried uh, was using SRAM. So if you put a RAM chip on the address bus and the data bus, it will just write to it because that's how it's been built. Uh, and you can then, if you have something like dual port RAM, which allows you to read while it's being written to, you can actually read the information out. These are sort of my plan for the future. I'm not giving up yet, but uh, I had badge code to write and other things, so this is sort of how far I got. For those who want to try this kind of stuff, I suggest you get one of these things. This is an eight channel logic analyzer. You can buy them for about 250 Rand locally or for about Somewhere between five and ten dollars $10 of China, or please take into account the 24 rand shipping fee our local post office now charges. But um, this is a knockoff. So Salier make a really, really good one. This is a knockoff, um, but it's good enough. It, in theory, goes up to 24 megahertz. I wouldn't bother trying to go that fast, but for the ZX Spectrum, it's perfectly fine. There's an open source project that talks to this called SIGROC. Uh, this is their... Pulse View, which is their online or their GTK interface to it, which is really, really cool. So you can see the individual pulses for the channels. It's got decoding, so it can decode the parallel bus. It's got SPI decoding and a whole lot of other things. And that, like I say, it costs 250 Rand. Um, I used mine pretty much constantly in this whole project because while I was trying to figure out what's wrong, why bits are being lost, this allows you to see it. Um, the other thing about this is that it's fully scriptable through Python. So they've actually got a Python interface. You can access all the data and that, which means that you can write some of the things that I've written in code. You could actually just use one of these and, and do it. The problem is it's only eight channel. Uh, the jump to a 16 channel goes through the roof pricing wise. You can get a 24 and a 32 channel one. Um, but yeah, no, I don't have that kind of money. Uh, there are much, much better ones. Um, if you own a Rigel uh, scope, the new Rigel oscilloscopes do have uh, logic analyzers built in. A lot of new hardware that comes out does have logic analyzers. But like I say, this is cheap. Um, for those of us like me who do this as a hobby, this thing's very nice. So, if you want to try this yourself, uh, yeah, that's title wrong. But anyway, um, so you can use. Emulators, if you want to play around with the ZX Spectrum, there's the Fuse GTK uh, emulator. It's really, really good. It actually emulates the multi-phase one, um, so you can do things like break the running app and all that kind of stuff. It does the entire range of ZX Spectrums. You can also read the currently running memory. You can poke values into the memory. You can pause it. You can step through the running code and all that kind of thing. So if you're interested 